right, so first of all, I want to thank uh, Doug and Ellen and Neil for organizing the conference and all of you for sticking <laughs> with long talks and, and making it to this time. So for um, 15 years that I interacted with Eric, every time that we would meet, he would uh, quiz me as a professor, which I guess he was, about every experimental system that we worked with. He would listen carefully uh, to everything that's going on in the lab, and then he would invariably pick one experimental system, and he said that you should drop everything else and focus on this one. So that's the system that I will um, tell you about, and um, I will, uh, in, in just a couple of slides, I'll tell you about the experiments and, and the questions that we address, but, and the people who did the work, but the general setting is as follows. When uh, you go from a single cell to a multicellular structure with functional tissues and organs, you form structures of two different types. So there are, so I guess, so there are structures that are singular, and then there are structures that are repeated. So you have only one head, you have one eye per lateral half, but then you have uh, dozens of teeth, uh, segments, you have millions of hair follicles, so there are singular and repeated structures. So these two types of structures form usually by very different mechanisms. They display uh, very different patterns of variation both within and across species. So if you want a head in one specific location in the embryo, you provide an inductive signal that ensures that the head is forming only there and nowhere else. On the other hand, if you want to generate millions of hair follicles, or if you want to generate hundreds of segments, you can rely on a mechanism that is more self-organized and more self-reliant. And also there are very different patterns of, as I said, variations both within and across species. So animals with two heads exist only in uh, fairy tales, but uh, there is great variety in the number of segments, in the number of teeth, in the number of hair follicles across uh, animals. And also within species, there can be traits that are variable and traits that are non-negotiable. So you always have one hand. There are multiple examples of structures of two of these kinds, singular and repeated, that are started by um, experimental techniques. And in each of these cases, there is a very long way from the initial condition when the structure is induced to the final structure. So we are inducing a heart, and in the end we have a functional heart. We're inducing a head, we have a functional head. So um, one of the things that I always admired in the uh, Davidson approach to development is that um, he and his um, uh, disciples always had a very well initial condition where the rules of the game were as well defined as possible, and they could track the structures essentially at a single cell resolution. Um, I will tell you about a system where we also have a very good initial condition. And also, I will tell you about a system where not only we have a very good initial condition, but we also have the ultimate structure that forms. So we can assay the final product of development. So the structure that is formed and the structure that we study is the actual of Drosophila species. So the embryo develops inside. It's a functional three-dimensional structure. From the functional standpoint, uh, so the embryo develops inside, and from the functional standpoint, first of all, it's, it, it is an extremely sophisticated membrane. It is something that has to make sure that oxygen can get in, and at the same time, you ensure that you don't lose too much water. So from the chemical engineering perspective, it, it is really quite uh, remarkable. So this is the micropile. This is where the sperm enters. This rough region is an operculum. This is where the larva hatches when the embry embryogenesis is complete. And uh, these two bunny ears, they, have, they are topologically identical to fingers in a glove. And uh, this is a snorkel through which the embryo is breathing when the egg itself is, sub is submerged in a muck, in, in whatever the substrate in which the egg is deposited. So this is the structure that, I will, that, that we have been studying for quite a while from the initial condition that I will define in a couple of slides. And um, what is particularly interesting about it is that this structure, this, the, the, the morphology of the actual, and particularly the morphology of the respiratory filaments on the actual, um, displays a great uh, variation across species. So this is a diagram from a textbook by Hinton that shows uh, actual morphologies in drosophilids 
of different kinds. And um, if you look, uh, so a lot of these things can be ordered from the Stock Center in San Diego and studied in the lab. And when you look at these eggshells, you find out that the respiratory filaments can vary in number. So this one has two, this one has three, this one has four, this one has five. They can vary in length, they can vary in shape. And uh, what is particularly interesting is that there are species where there is two and always two respiratory filaments. Just we have two and always two eyes. And within the species, this will not be variable at all. So in this species, there is three and always three. In this one, there is four and always four. But at the same time, there are species, so this one is called Scapta drosophila patersoni, where the number of these respiratory appendages or respiratory filaments is variable within the species. So furthermore, even a single female can lay eggshells where the number of these filaments will vary, anywhere from five to eight. Okay, so today I will describe what we have learned about the mechanisms by which these tubes form. I will tell you that we understand um, the process to the extent that we can account for every cell and furthermore for every edge of every cell that participates in this process and we can count every cell pretty much in the same way that uh, in the early sea urchin embryo you can count every cell that contributes to Archenteron. So based on the genetic experiments and observational studies, I will tell you that we are in a position to formulate the simplest dynamical model that accounts both the induction of the structure and the morphological and its morphological formation. And I will end with the speculation of the mechanisms that can explain the variations across species based on the experimental observations of morphogenesis and pattern formation across species. So before I go any further, I need to tell you that most of what I'll present today is the work of Miriam Osterfield, um, a remarkable scientist, a former postdoc in my lab who has just started her own group at UT Southwestern. And um, she was greatly aided by Zin Zin Du, a former graduate student, and Lili Chong, who is also a former graduate student. I'll tell you about what um, they're doing uh, right now at the end of the talk. So if you want to model something, ideally you want something with the simplest possible anatomy, and with really well-defined initial conditions. So what are the initial conditions? Uh, we have eggshells that house eggs. So these eggs develop in the ovaries of the female. So if this is a drosophila, the abdomen is filled with ovaries. There are two ovaries, and each ovary is, um, has several ovarials. So there are about a dozen ovarials in each ovary. Each ovariole has egg chambers, precursors of the mature egg, in different stages of development. So the egg chamber is a relatively simple anatomical structure that has only three cell types. So I will tell you where each of these cell types is coming from, but at this stage, so this is roughly um, 150 microns, 200 microns at this stage, there is one oocyte, there are 15 nurse cells, so the oocyte and the nurse cells are, come from the germline and um, enveloping this cluster of 16 germline derived uh, cells is an epithelial sheet that is somatically derived. If you look closer at the structure, you are going to discover that the germline derived cells are connected to each other through ring canals. There are little doors, like doors in a house, through which uh, mRNA and proteins can be ferried from the nurse cells into the oocyte. So we have a system with only three cell types in the germline. Where do they come from? There is a single uh, stem cell that generates this cluster of um, germline uh, of, of the oocyte in nurse cells. The cell divides four times, so two, four, eight, 16. These divisions are incomplete, the cytokinetic furrow stalls, and these stalled cytokinetic furrows are the ring canals that you saw on the previous slide. So this cluster of 16, so Im imagine uh, an, a, a set of 16 basketballs that can be arranged in space, and this is the cluster that is then covered by a sweater of uh, uh, epithelial cells. So there are somatic stem cells that divide and envelope and ensheath uh, this cluster of germ cells. And uh, each ovarial, and uh, as you exit the place in the ovary where the structures are formed, which is called germarium, you form uh, egg chambers at different stages of development. And when you dissect a single um, female drosophila, you have a great range of the same structure that you study in different stages of development. Very good. So um, as oogenesis proceeds, the structure that is formed of a cluster covered by an epithelial layer grows 
So the nerve cells on the oocyte, they, they grow at different rate. And midway through oogenesis, it looks like this. So there is one oocyte. Next to the oocyte, there are 15 nerve cells that are nursing it. And on top of the oocyte, there is this follicular epithelium that at this stage looks as if every cell in this follicular epithelium is identical. So you have this quasi-hexagonal monolayer of epithelial cells on top of the oocyte. And it is from this two-dimensional structure that is formed out of identical cells that we form this something that topologically is similar to a glove with two fingers. So how does it happen? It turns out that because of the patterning events that I will describe in the next couple of slides, there are two groups of cells are singled out from this monolayer epithelium to build the tubes. Each of the tubes, I told you, looks like a glove in a, like a finger in a glove with a seam underneath. It's called the floor cells, and then there is the top of the finger. And each of these fingers is formed from a primordium that has two adjacent and non-overlapping types of cells. The primordium looks like a blue eye with a red eyebrow. And there are two primordia like this. So there are two primordia that are specified during the previous stage of development, and you have two of these respiratory filaments that you form. How does it work? This is something that we have been studying for a long time, and we have a reasonably complete understanding, starting from inductive signals to the genes that these inductive signals control, to the transcription factors that connect inductive signals to the inductive genes, including the regulatory regions of these genes at the level of cis, cis regulatory elements, all the good stuff that Eric would have approved of. So, but abstracting 10 years of work, I can tell you that there is an inductive signal that is gherkin that comes from the oocyte and forms a long-ranged gradient that is where locally produced ligand signals through uniformly expressed receptors in the follicular epithelium. So you have something that looks like this gradient. So this gradient here is an inductive signal. This is an EGF ligand that signals through uniformly expressed receptors. And it acts through, sever through a network where the, really the heart of the network is this incoherent feedforward loop that controls the gene that will correspond to one of the eyes in, in, in two of these primordia. So this gene is induced by the inductive signal, but the inductive signal also triggers the expression of the repressor of the gene. So only when the level of the inductive signal is above the threshold necessary for induction and below the threshold that is necessary to trigger the expression of repressor, you have uh, the signal that is induced. So in the end of the day, so this is the schematic of these, and by the way, this is the fate map in the system that was figured out by uh, Celeste Burke at the University of Washington. So this is not a cartoon, these are the real expression pattern. This is the blue eye, and this is the red eyebrow, and this is the inductive signal that comes from the oocyte, and this is, so this is the response to the inductive signal that comes from the oocyte, and this is the source of the inductive signal itself. This is the famous gherkin that was discovered by Trudy Schubach. All right, so we have a two-dimensional fate map, and it's interesting to realize that here we're dealing with an intrinsically two-dimensional pattern on a two-dimensional manifold. So we have two distinct domain, localized domains of gene expression that are triggered by localized inductive signal. How do we go from this two-dimensional gene expression pattern to the three-dimensional structure? So here the cells are flat, and to understand how this flat two-dimensional manifold is converted into a three-dimensional structure, Miriam Osterfield adapted live imaging protocols that were established by Celeste Berg and Denise Mantel to visualize the formation of the three-dimensional structure in real time. So um, can we play a movie? So, just be, so before you play the movie, you will see a structure that emerges from this two-dimensional sheet. So first of all, you see that cells have constricted. And now the structure will emerge from the sheet, and it will appear can, can, and it will appear that the system is growing. But in fact, there is absolutely no cell growth, and there is no cell division, and there is no cell death in, this, in the system. So it's, it is a fixed number of cells that rearranges within this two-dimensional manifold, forming this two-dimensional structure. So it is not, can we play it once again? Um, I assure you, so it, it was fantastic to see it live, but it is really not trivial to see what is happening even based on these live imaging movies. So in the next slide, I will tell you, but, so the most important thing here to realize is that each of these respiratory filaments is formed by a primordium that has a relatively small number of cells. There is approximately 60 cells in the blue eye, and there is exactly 15 cells in the red eyebrow. And the fate map that was um, 
uh, produced by uh, Celeste Berg is such that the tip of the eyebrow maps to the tip of the appendage. Okay, and you form the structure in a way that this cell buttons with this cell, this cell buttons with this cell, and this cell buttons with, with this cell. So these cells, the red cells, before the three-dimensional morphogenesis is initiated, they have, they contact the yellow cells in the middle, in the space between primordia, and as you button up the shirt, they leave the yellow cells behind, and the, and the red cell buttons with red cells, okay? So to understand more quantitatively, and in essentially mathematical detail, exactly what is happening with every cell, Miriam used three-dimensional image reconstruction algorithms, exactly the same algorithms that are used to trace neurites in the developing nervous system, but instead of neurites, she was tracing the boundaries between different cells. So before morphogenesis initiates, this two-dimensional primordium viewed from this direction looks like this. So here is the red eyebrow, and here is the blue eye. At the next state of morphogenesis, and you can reconstruct it from uh, subsequent from sequential uh, frames from live imaging movie, this primordium buckles out from the epithelium, and but the adjacencies between cells are still the same. At the next stage, the cells begin rearranging. So this so this remains the tip of the structure, and then this cell will partner with this cell, leaving the yellow cell behind, and then you will progressively button up this structure, and in the end. This is the finger of a glove that you form. So this is how, you, and it, it is absolutely, it, so this is like origami, but with an added twist of cell rearrangements. So you formed a three-dimensional structure without change in the number of cells. So this is the kinematic description of the system, but as a convinced Newtonian, you should be asking yourself, what are the forces that drive uh, th this um, mechanical transformation? So, so before everything starts, before morphogenesis is initiated, the angles between the cells, cell edges and the epithelium are approximately 120 degrees, which reflects that the packing of the, the state where the packing of cells is approximately hexagonal. But at the next stage, the, some cells transition from hexagons to rectangles, and some of the angles become either 180 degrees or 90 degrees. So what is actually happening? So you have these straight cell borders as if the tension is increased along these lines of cells, as if you single out some contour, some border between two, two cell domains, and you made this boundary very costly energetically stretching. So what is happening at, at, at the stage that just precedes this? You localize non-muscle myosin that straightens out these edges. And now imagine an elastic membrane and you single out in this elastic membrane a contractile contour that you begin squeezing. So in response to the squeezing, this flat tissue will blister out, it will buckle out. And this is exactly the kick that transforms the two-dimensional primordium into the third dimension before the, um, these changes have initiated. So to start thinking um, in more simplified ways about our data, Zin Zindu, who collaborated with Miriam, developed a computational model that allows one to start with a hexagonal packing of cells where each cell wants to be of a certain area. So this is the energy of the cell configuration that tells you that every cell wants to be of a certain area, so this term is not so important. And this term also tells you that each edge costs you energy. So when these parameters A and sigma are identical for the entire tissue, this tissue looks just like a packing of identical hexagons. At the same time, you can pattern the system, and you can say that particular edges are, particularly co are, are very costly, or you can say that some cells want to constrict. When you do it in two dimensions, without letting cells move into the third dimension, you will find out that some of the angles will become closer to 180 degrees, and some cells will constrict. And if you also let cells move in the third dimension, you will see that the structure will first buckle, and then you will initiate this sequential buttoning up of the structures. Can we play this movie? Okay, so the first button is buttoned. The second one, so here it looks like a Godzilla. The third one, so now a couple of frames will be skipped. This is just a plotting artifact, never mind. So we're skipping a couple of steps. Okay, and you form a structure where each of these so he, here, this was the tip of the primordium, and here the two cells are buttoned like this. All right, thank you. 
So to summarize, what you have seen so far, uh, okay. So what you have seen so far is that in this case, we know that we have a two-dimensional primordium. We know how this two-dimensional primordium is established. There is an inductive signal that acts through a network that contains a feedforward loop with well-identified transcription factors that talk to two genes with characterized enhancers to form this primordium where there is a blue eye and a red eyebrow. This changes the shapes of cells in two dimensions. This initiates initial buckling of this primordium in the third dimension, and this, then this guides sequential cell rearrangements. So um, the same model can explain how this structure of the respiratory filaments is transformed in mutants. So for example, when the inductive signal is not strong enough to induce the repressor that splits the primordium, you will form not, two, you will form not a two-fingered glove, but uh, a one-fingered finger, glove, and the same model can explain it, both at the patterning and the level of morphogenesis. When the system and when the signal that induces everything is delocalized without inducing a uh, re repressor, the structure that you form does not look like a glove with fingers, but it looks like a mitten that you use in a kitchen to grab hot things. So there is a transition from, from a glove to a uh, mitten. So to summarize, so this is a system where we can go from an extremely well-defined initial condition with well-defined inductive signal to the two-dimensional primordium th that is formed through a combination of a gradient that acts through a feedforward loop through gene regulation by multiple enhancers. So all of this is in Melanogaster, and everything can be summarized in this very complicated equation that says that the number of appendages equals to the number of primordia. But then we have all of these other species, okay? So this is a giveaway. So this is a species where you form five or eight uh, appendages. Do we have five distinct primordia? The answer is definitely no. So in this case, Miriam found out that there is just a single primordium where there is a broad swath of cell that actually looks like a primordium of this mutant in Drosophila melanogaster. But here you form a mitten, whereas here you form an honest to God glove. That you can, where you can, that can fit five uh, fingers. So there is a continuous primordium that contains uh, the domain that corresponds to the future roof cells, and in front of this primordium, there is a single cell-wide group of cells that corresponds to the future floor cells. So it's uh, the structure that you, so you, so the equation is, is not true that we um, derived, quote unquote, and there's a melanogaster. And also the structure that you form is very, very different. In melanogaster, you formed these fingers by sequential cell rearrangements. The structure that you will see now, can, can we please play it, right? Is a structure where the, you will not see two rows of identical cells, but you will see an incredibly extended edge of a single cell. So what is happening, so it, it's a structure that forms essentially without cell rearrangements. So what is happening here, it's as if you started with a, so this is what happens in Drosophila melanogaster. This is what is happening in Scapta Drosophila patersoni. So what is happening is that you have a two-dimensional primordium where the cells are arranged in a single line. And what you are doing, it's as if you are grabbing every other cell and you're pulling it out into the third dimension. And the system is somehow patterned, and I will describe it in just uh, a little bit, in a way that makes the edges that are being pulled extremely pliable. So the structure that you form is very different, and at the cellular, cellular level, uh, the events that are happening are also very different. Instead of cell rearrangements, you have very extreme cell deformations where one of the edges is deformed to the state that is um, five or six or 10 cell diameters. So this is what is happening at the kinematic level. So this, is actually, this might be similar to what you have seen in the very first talk of this symposium, in Michael's talk, where he showed that there is some period doubling in gene expression patterns. So it, it, it looks as if every other cell is doing something differently. Well, is there actually a molecular pattern that has period two? It turns out, so, so this is the flat primordium, and you uh, pull on every other edge, and you pull it out of the primordium. So is there a molecular pre-pattern that has the right periodicity to explain what is happening? So this is the reconstruction of sequential stages. It turns out that the answer is yes. Yes, so this is the line of cells. Okay, so this is the line of cells that corresponds to the front of the primordium. These are the cells that end up at the bottom of the 
fingers, as it were. And it turns out that every uh, that um, APKC is localized to every other edge. So this is exactly period two pattern. So those of you who know about the planar cell polarity mechanisms know that it is not a problem to establish a pattern where every where on one edge of a cell you will have a protein and on the other cell you would not have a protein. Okay, but this is a pattern that is really period two. We we know that this pattern is here. We know that it prefigures the formation of the structure that looks as if every other cell uh, edge is pulled. How this pattern is formed at the molecular level, we have absolutely no idea. But this period two pattern that we have heard about in the very first lecture, I'm almost done, of this uh, colloquium is, um, is here. All right. So the final point that I want to make, um, and I think this is the next to, to, to last slide, is that there are individual variations in the appendage number. So in this experiment, Miriam took individual females from Scapta Drosophila patersoni, and she asked about the variations of the egg, so you, of the um, number of respiratory filaments that a single female would produce. And for example, she found out that even a single female can lay eggs that have anywhere between five and six and seven and eight uh, appendages. So what can actually be happening here? And I think here we have a perfect example, at least of something that at least phenomenologically looks like a wave-like Turing-type mechanism. So what can be happening? So the system is generating a primordium, correct? In front of this primordium is a bent line of cells. So, so this is basically a one-dimensional system. And along this line, there is a pattern that has periodicity of two cells. So imagine that you make this primordium one cell bigger or one cell shorter. So as you make this, so it's like having a, str a vibrating string. And if you make the string a little bit longer, you will let in one more or one less uh, wave crest in a system. So we think that the variations that come in the system reflect the variations in the size of the primordium. All right. So to summarize what I told you, in general, the structures that are singular and repeated are very different, play very different roles in the body. They form by very different mechanisms. They are studied in isolation. I think the formation of respiratory filaments in eggshells of drosophilids is an interesting system where one can study transitions between two different patterning mechanisms, very much like you study transitions between different types of segmentation where all the segments are specified at the same time or one by one, okay? Um, so can, can we have the last slide, yeah. So I want to uh, end with uh, acknowledging the people who did the work. So uh, Miriam did all the imaging and live imaging and reconstruction and um, work in the system and really uh, pushed the experiments into the, not in the, um, the species other than Drosophila and Alagaster. Uh, Lily, so and Miriam, so this is a, was a truly interdisciplinary project, so Miriam uh, is trained as a cell biologist who work with myself, Trudy Schubach, and Eric Wischels, looking at three-dimensional epithelial morphogenesis in a system. Lily Chong, who played a key role in figuring out the enhancers in a system, is a chemical engineer by training, and she worked with me and together with Elisa Fuchs and George Pirovalakis at Freiburg in uh, doing the enhancer bashing for genes that correspond to the uh, eye and eyebrow of the system, and Xin Xin Du, is a physicist who played a key role in understanding the live imaging data from Miriam and coming up with an animation that describes what can be happening in a system. And I can tell you that this model-driven animation played an absolutely key role in everybody understanding what might be happening in a system and using it as the least common denominator about discussing and destroying different mechanisms. So uh, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you.